Joe and Siobhan, thanks for sitting down with me today to talk about Westpac's latest news around green bonds and the sustainable finance market more broadly. There's a lot going on in the market, so great to get your views. So Joe, I'll start with you. Westpac has issued its latest green bond, this one into the European market. Can you tell us a little bit about the bond, the price, uh, the, the use of proceeds uh, and what demand was like? Sure, so thanks Emma. Uh, so last week, you're right, we did price a 1 billion euro green tier two bond. Uh, this is our first tier two bond in Europe and our first in green format. Um, the green format was very important to us. Um, and it, it's, you know, in terms of this transaction, it's what we call a use of proceeds transaction. Uh, and for us, what that means is that we're committing to use the, the funding from this transaction to support uh, either through financing or refinancing our um, sustainable projects across our, our um, bank. And some of those uh, sustainable projects relate to um, renewable projects um, like solar and wind, um, also green buildings and low carbon rail transport. Um, I think from our perspective, and it's important, the market that we went to here was Europe and Europe is really leading the way in the green space. Um, you know, we had over 100 investors participate in this transaction and um, yeah, the biggest allocation going to France with 24% of the bonds. Um, for us, we had good participation from the broader uh, Europeans. So we saw a representation from Germany, from uh, the Netherlands, also the UK, who were um, also big players, um, as well as um, obviously seeing interest in other parts of um, of Europe as well as into Asia. In terms of pricing, we priced the bond at 105 basis points over the swap rate, which was the tightest price for an Australian uh, tier two bond in Europe since the GFC. Um, we also think that there was some benefit for this, um, for this bond being in the green format, which indicates that investors really are um, increasing their demand for this green product. Okay, and Siobhan, as Joe's mentioned, uh, sustainable finance initiatives and green bonds do play a big part, important part of the bank's strategy around sustainability and in addressing climate change. Can you talk us through how the bank thinks about this and, and where it's at in terms of stump some of the targets? Yeah, so the way we think about it is, you know, we want to be able to um, I guess really understand the nature of the ESG risks that our customers have and by, by understanding our customers' ESG risks, it actually helps us address our own ESG risks. Then we want to be able to help our customers finance um, their transition. So we want to help them shift uh, to that net zero carbon economy that Joe talked about. And then we want to back those customers that are fit for a net zero future. So we really think about it in terms of those three key areas. Uh, in terms of our targets, we've set ourselves a target of 3.5 billion in terms of uh, lending to climate solutions uh, out to 2023. And actually over the last half year, we've um, delivered 0.5 billion already. Um, and we've set ourselves a target out to 2030 of 15 billion. Um, and uh, over uh, the last, um, in terms of our current exposure to um, climate solutions, we're at, um, at 10 billion in terms of total committed exposure. Then we think about um, in terms of our exposure to emissions intensive sectors and we put in place criteria to, to limit our exposure there and to shift uh, towards that net zero economy as well. So for example, in terms of our lending to electricity generation, uh, we're now at 75% of that being to renewables and only 25% to fossil fuels. A really good example of a shift um, over, a, over a number of years uh, that really demonstrates that commitment over time. And Joe, you mentioned this Euro Tier 2 bond is the first by an Aussie bank. Um, the European market for green bonds is, is really dominating at the moment. Uh, it's far outpacing the growth of, say, the American markets and Asia. Do you think that demand is going to continue to be dom dominated by European investors? Or perhaps as we're seeing a change in the Biden administration, do you think we might see an uptick in interest from the US market? Yeah, so thanks Emma. I think you're right. Europe is really leading the way here and has led the way for, for quite some time uh, as this market's been developing. What we uh, have seen is that European um, institutions, the sovereigns and, um, and companies that uh, made up around 50% of all um, green, social and sustainability um, bond issuance to date. 
Um, from our perspective, this is not surprising given that the political institutions and, and the leadership of the EU are really critical here. Uh, and they've said that they want to be the first climate um, neutral bloc by 2050, and that, that's, that's quite a critical piece. However, what we're seeing, you're right, is that the US and Asian markets are catching up quite quickly here. Um, you know, certainly in terms of size and, um, and sophistication and also some of the government policies that have been putting in place um, will continue to further support that development. Um, in particular, I think as you stated, um, with Joe Biden as president now um, of the US and moving really to reinstate the US um, back to the, to the Paris Agreement, we, we expect that there will continue to be a lot more development of green um, and sustainable and social bonds in, in the US over time. And in terms of the bank's overall funding, where does sustainable debt fit into that? And do you think we can expect to see it making up a bigger part of the bank's overall funding structure into the future? Yeah, so I, I'd certainly like it to, to be a, a greater part of the uh, overall bank's funding um, composition. Um, we certainly expect that it will become a bigger part of uh, over time. Um, and certainly, it, you know, one of the reasons for this is that it does deliver on our climate change objectives and really um, supports our, our broader climate change commitment um, you know, to, f to finance projects that really uh, support the transition to that ne net zero um, uh, economy that I spoke about earlier. Um, this will, of course, have to be a balanced in terms of our overall funding needs. And, um, and you know, as we see this economic recovery overweigh in Australia, I think we'll, we'll start to, remo to move to a more normal uh, funding pattern in the second half of, of calendar 2021. And you mentioned the, the you know, booming growth of green bonds globally. Do you think it's getting closer to becoming considered a mainstream investment? Yeah, so I think the market has come a long way. Um, we're certainly starting to see that investor mandates for a sustainable product are becoming more of a um, more of a standard, and they're certainly starting to drive liquidity in this space. Um, I think that certainly, you know, what we're seeing is a lot more, um, you know, dark green type investors and people who are really focused and dedicated ESG funds um, who are moving into this space with, with mandates. And for us, that, that's really encouraging. Um, we're also starting to see a number of investors who are looking through the labelled product of the issuer um, themselves and making sure that the issuer has strong ESG credentials. So I think for us, it's, it's, you know, what we're seeing is that it's, it's not good enough to have a corporate and social responsibility um, as an add-on to your overall program and your strategy, um, but sustainability really has to become part of how you run the organisation. So I think that that's now becoming quite critical, and that's certainly how we think about it at Westpac as well. Okay. And following on from that, Siobhan, if we look at uh, the finance sector's role globally in helping in the transition to a lower carbon future, the size of investment and funding needed to help in that transition is quite eye-watering. Do you feel like the finance sector is up for the challenge, um, both globally and also more particularly in Australia, given potentially our national policies aren't quite yet as advanced or ambitious as some other countries? Look, you're right. The momentum is pretty extraordinary at the moment. As Joe mentioned, I think that the shift in global politics, we've just recently seen the, the Biden um, virtual summit uh, and countries making very significant um, uh, statements and commitments. And that is translating in, into finance. Uh, we're now seeing in Europe the EU taxonomy, so basically defining what does green investment look like. And we're seeing similar initiatives here in Australia with the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative also setting out guidance around what, what defines uh, sustainability performance as well. And what we're seeing is that banks, insurers and investors are actually working together, collaborating to define this and really shape um, a market around sustainability. And it's in fact, it's, it's quite competitive in some respects, but actually also quite collegiate in another way as well, as it becomes much more integrated to how we think about finance. And finally, Siobhan, the regulators are taking much more of an interest in the way banks are managing their climate risks as our shareholders. Can you see that we might be moving towards a, a mandatory uh, climate risk disclosure regime, similar to what we've seen in some other countries like the UK and New Zealand? Um, and also, is Westpac ready for that? 
Yeah, look, it's, it's been really interesting. In the last uh, fortnight, we've seen APRA release uh, climate guidance, draft climate guidance, which really sets out how an organisation, particularly a bank um, or another financial institution, might uh, factor in and consider its approach to managing climate risk. And it really sets out guidance uh, both at a board level as well as management in terms of how a company does that. But fundamentally, it lines up its approach to recommendations of the TCFD or Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And that's very much emerging as the standard around how to report on climate risk. We've seen that now mandated in the New Zealand market and effectively it's expected now. So most investors now expect large institutions to be reporting in line with the TCFD and I think we can expect that it will certainly is um, expected or, or uh, will be increasingly required uh, in terms of those regulatory expectations. Um, in terms of uh, mandating, well, I think we've got a, a, still a way to go, but certainly we're now working with APRA around a climate vulnerability assessment. So that is uh, the four major banks, uh, actually five uh, significant banks in Australia, now working through co-designing a stress test for climate risk. And we'll be putting that in place in the latter part of this year as well. So certainly the expectations and the firming up of regulatory expectation are shifting. Well, Siobhan and Joe, it's always great to hear your views. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.